You're listening to the expository preaching ministry of Kootenai Community Church, located in Kootenai, Idaho. We pray that Christ is exalted and your spirit is blessed by the teaching of God's Word. For more information about Kootenai Church, please visit us online at kootenaichurch.org. On January 8, 1956, on a lonely riverbed deep in the Ecuador jungle, five missionaries, five missionary men landed to take the gospel to a yet unreached people, the Aka Indians. The Aka Indians for years had been known to kill any strangers or visitors without question, without compromise. In fact, they had already killed several Shell Oil Company employees. And that had become news. And yet these five missionary men wanted to take the gospel to the Aka Indians, and they did so on January 8, 1956. And as they came ashore in that deep Ecuador jungle, they were speared and hacked to death by violent Aka warriors. Among that group of men was probably two names that you're familiar with, Jim Elliott and Nate Saint. And you look at that and you say, we've got five missionary men, so now we have five widows, five women who have been bereft of their husbands, and children who have been robbed of their fathers. Is that a pointless death? Is that a senseless tragedy? Or is it possible for God to bring something good out of something that to us seems pointless? Now at first blush, you may hear that story and say, oh, that was a senseless tragedy, a pointless death. These five men, without even being able to communicate a single syllable of the good news to these tribes, lost their lives and left behind children without fathers and women without husbands. Pointless, senseless, useless tragedy. But those who know the story and are familiar with the details other than just the surface details would tell you something different. Elizabeth Elliot, the widow of Jim Elliot, now an author, she wrote in her book Through the Gates of Splendor, or Through Gates of Splendor, she writes this, To the world at large, this was a sad waste of five young lives, but God had His plan in purpose in all things. There were those whose lives were changed by what happened on Palm Beach. In Brazil, a group of Indians at a mission station deep in Mato Grosso, upon hearing the news, dropped to their knees and cried out to God for forgiveness for their own lack of concern for fellow Indians who did not know Jesus Christ. From Rome, an American official wrote to one of the widows, quote, I knew your husband. He was to me the ideal of what a Christian should be, end quote. An Air Force major stationed in England with many hours of jet flying immediately began making plans to join the Missionary Aviation Fellowship. A missionary in Africa wrote, Our work will never be the same. We knew two of the men, and their lives have left their mark on ours. Off the coast of Italy, an American naval officer was involved in an accident at sea. As he floated alone on a raft, he recalled Jim Elliott's words, which he had read in a newspaper report, saying, when it comes time to die, make sure that all you have to do is die. So Jim Elliott said. He prayed that he might not, that he might be saved knowing that he had more to do than to just die. He was not ready. God answered his prayer and he was rescued. In Des Moines, Iowa, an 18-year-old boy prayed for a week in his room and then announced to his parents, I'm turning my life over completely to the Lord. I want to try and take the place of one of those five. Life magazine carried a 10-page article on their life, their mission, and their death. Did God use that for good? Sure He did. And like the death of Stephen, God has used the death of those five men, Jim Elliott, Nate Saint, and the rest of them, for inconceivable amounts of good for the cause of Christ. In fact, his story continues to have a positive impact for the Gospel even today among countless thousands of Christians who read the story and are touched by Jim Elliott's radical obedience to the Lord even knowing it would cost him his own life. And of course, Elizabeth Elliott's example, she later went to that same beach and took the Gospel to those same Indians who had killed her husband and some of them got saved. God continues to use that for good. And God used the death of Stephen, which we looked at last week, for innumerable good. Incredible amounts of good. 
God has a way of taking things that to us seem terrible, wrong, useless, pointless, and evil, and using them for good purposes. He did it with Jim Elliot, and He did it with the death of Stephen and his stoning in Acts chapter 8. In fact, as we read on in Acts chapter 8, we see that it was because of the death of Stephen that the Gospel finally went outside of the city of Jerusalem. So that now the Gospel, rather than just being inside the city of Jerusalem, which it has been for chapters 1 through 7, now finally makes its way outside. And what is it that starts that? It's the death of Stephen. Because Luke tells us that from the time that Stephen died, from that point there rose a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem and the believers were scattered. So now Luke begins to tell us about how the Gospel went from one city and the rest of the book is how it went all over the Roman Empire. Eventually to the city of Rome itself by the mouth of Paul the Apostle. So chapters 1-7 through is just Jerusalem is the idea. Chapters 8 through the rest of the book, it's all over the place. So now we get to see how the Gospel went to Samaria. God's going to take these new believers through some baby steps. He's not going to send them off to Rome with it right away. He's kind of taking them in small steps. You're going to go from Jerusalem out into the regions of Judea and then eventually to Samaria and then to the remotest parts of the world. So we see how the Gospel goes to Samaria. And I want you to notice two things. First, that it is initiated by Philip. And second, that it is confirmed by the apostles. The Samaritan mission is initiated by Philip. Look at verse 4. Therefore, those who had been scattered, and remember what it was that had scattered them, Saul of Tarsus began ravaging the church. And the word means to tear apart like a wild beast tears apart a corpse. He sunk his teeth into it and he began to ravage the church with the intention of destroying it. And because of that, believers were scattered all over. They left the city of Jerusalem because that was a cauldron of persecution. And they went out into the surrounding regions. One of them was a man named Philip who went to Samaria. Verse 4 says that those who had been scattered went about preaching the Word. And there was one man who had been scattered. His name is Philip. And he goes down to the city of Samaria. Now it took a persecution to scatter the church. As you read the book of Acts, chapters 1-7, through you don't get the impression that these believers were too keen on the idea of taking the Gospel to the remotest parts of the world. You don't get that impression. What you do see is a group of men who are much like ourselves, very reluctant to really go outside of their comfort zone, very reluctant to step out and take the Gospel to the farthest known reaches of the then known world. They don't seem keen on that idea. They seem very conservative, very sort of cloistered in their own little world. That's the impression we get. What does it take for the Gospel to go outside of their own little world? Somebody had to come in and try and stomp it out. And that's what scattered them. And persecution, far from having the negative impact that you and I might think it has, had a positive impact. Because when Saul took that church in Jerusalem and started tearing it to pieces, all those pieces went all over the area. And now he had, rather than one church in one city to deal with, he had all kinds of churches in all kinds of different cities all over the Roman provinces to deal with. So it had a positive impact. And it was the persecution of the believers that eventually scattered them. Why weren't they willing to go out before this? It could be that the apostles were just busy. Remember the exponential growth that's taking place? Upwards of 20,000, maybe more believers within the city of Jerusalem. And the 12 apostles are dealing with discipline issues and discipleship issues and financial issues, administrative issues, teaching and preaching, evangelism and equipping men. They've got all of that going on. It could be that they were just too busy at this point to really be thinking about the worldwide outreach of the Christian mission. Or it could be that believers in the city, by and large, were just like you and I. They don't like to share their faith outside of their comfort zone. If somebody happens to walk into my house and sit down at my table and open up a Bible and say to me, who's Jesus and what did He do? Then I'll share the Gospel with Him. But other than that, you and I pretty much tend to cloister up. Sharing the Gospel is not something that comes naturally to most of us. It's not something that most of us feel comfortable doing because to confess... We feel ill-equipped to do it, don't we? We're afraid that in sharing the Gospel with somebody, they're going to ask us that one question that no Christian, no theologian, no philosopher has ever in the history of the world been able to answer. And that they're going to ask it of us and we're going to be put on the spot. We feel ill-equipped. I don't know why we should feel ill-equipped. All we have is the Word of God, the power of God, the Spirit of God. So it's no wonder we feel ill-equipped with all, all only that in our arsenal to share Christ with an individual. But it's likely that these Jews just got comfortable in the city of Jerusalem 
And it took being pushed outside of their comfort zone to take the gospel with them. Because God is more concerned with the spread of his word than he is about my comfort or your comfort. And I hate to break that to you. God is more concerned with the progress of the gospel than he is with your comfort. And so he uses Saul to ravage the church and to spread these believers all over the place. One of the people that spread is a man named Philip. This is not Philip the Apostle. How do I know that? Because verse 1 of chapter 8 says that the apostles stayed in Jerusalem. So now we have a Philip who's not an apostle. He's the Philip that was selected as one of the seven back in Acts chapter 6 to distribute food to the needy. This is that Philip. This Philip is kind of an interesting character because he sort of takes the preeminent stage here between Peter, who occupies the first part of the book, and Paul, who occupies the latter part of the book. You have these two characters in the middle. Stephen, who has an incredible impact, particularly on Saul, and then we change our focus to Philip. Philip is known as an evangelist, because in Acts chapter 21, verse 8, it says that they lodged at the house of Philip the evangelist. So that means that Philip had the gift of evangelism, and although the Bible tells us that God gives evangelists to the church, there's only one person in all of Scripture ever called an evangelist, and it's this Philip. So you have Philip, who has the gift of evangelism, going out to an unreached people group who are obviously willing to listen to the gospel presentation, and you would expect some good fruit there, wouldn't you? It's exactly what you see. Philip is an evangelist, not the apostle Philip, and he lands in Samaria. Now, to understand the significance of Samaria, or to understand the significance of what you're about to read, you have to have the history of Samaria. The Jews and the Samaritans did not get along, just in case you're unaware of that. The Jews and the Samaritans did not get along. And that went back centuries, back to the end of the reign of Solomon when the northern ten tribes broke away from the southern two tribes. And when they split and the northern ten tribes established their king and their priesthood and their worship system up north, it created a rift in the nation of Israel that never, never was resolved, even up to the day of Jesus. And those that's where the division between the north and the south started. It was with that division. From the point that they rebelled all the way through to 722 B.C. when they were taken captive by the Assyrians, their history is one of apostasy and false worship and idolatry and wickedness and wicked kings and just a nation caught in its own sin and they never recovered from it until God sent them judgment at the hand of the Assyrians. When the Assyrians came into the northern tribe, they scattered those Jews all over the Assyrian Empire and they sent Gentiles in there to live with those people in an attempt to intermingle them so that you wouldn't have Jews and Assyrians. You would have a mixture and they would all be Assyrians. There would be no, no geographical, no national difference whatsoever. Well, that was successful because the northern ten tribes were basically melded in with all of these Gentiles so that the th- southern ten tribes would look at them and say, you're a bunch of half-breeds. That's all you are. You're Jews who didn't value your Jewishness enough to keep yourselves pure from the Gentiles, and you intermarried and intermingled and produced offspring with these Assyrians, and that was the Samaritans. And so the southern half, the southern two tribes, would look at the northern tribes and say, you're a bunch of half-breed, apostate, heretics. And the division that existed was not made any better by the fact that in, in Ezra's time, Zerubbabel refused help from the northern tribes in building the temple. He said, you know, have no part in this. That's what he said to the Samaritans. Well, what'd they do? They went and built their own temple on Mount Gerizim. So now you had them worshiping in one place and the southern Jews worshiping in another place. And the hatred was so intense that when a Jew was traveling from Jerusalem north, they would go around the region of Samaria. They would go across the Jordan River, up on the east side of the Jordan River, and back across rather than walk through Samaria, adding days perhaps to their journey, miles and hours to what the expected journey would be. And if they had to pass through Samaria, when they came back into Judea, they would knock the dust off their feet lest they pollute Jewish dirt with Samaritan dirt. That's how much they hated each other. Intense hatred. John sums it up well. John chapter 4, verse 9. The Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. That's how he sums up the whole history. The Jews do not have any dealings with Samaritans. Well, Philip's a Jew. What's he doing in Samaria? Why did he go to Samaria? You know why I went to Samaria? Because Jesus said you'd be my witnesses in Samaria. Can you get an appreciation of the prejudices that Philip would have had to set aside to walk onto Samaritan dirt and to preach the gospel to these people? 
And he would have had to make an assumption that probably most Jews would not have been willing to make, and that is that a Samaritan actually had a soul that could be saved. And Philip goes there and he preaches the gospel to them. Friends, let me ask you, what prejudices do you allow to stand in the way of you sharing your faith with people? Skin color? Race? Nationality? Ethnic background? Political persuasion? You say, oh, they're too rich. They're not going to understand the gospel. Oh, they're too poor. They don't need that. Oh, there's just a bunch of New Age hippies. They'll never accept Christ. What preconceived notions, what prejudices do you let stand in the way and give you an excuse to not share Christ? Philip didn't do that. He laid aside all of his prejudices and he was obedient to the Lord and he went right down and did what probably no other Jew would have done. Give the gospel to the Samaritans. He was an evangelist. And he saw unreached people and he said, I want to reach them. And he went there knowing that it would probably cause a lot of stir back home with the apostles and probably the rest of the church back in the city of Jerusalem. But Philip goes into the city of Samaria, verse 4. Verse 5, he began proclaiming Christ to them, and the crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip. He's an evangelist who goes to unreached people groups. He lays aside his prejudices, loves these people, proclaims Christ to them, and there's tremendous fruit. The crowds are coming out to hear Philip. And the crowds are giving attention to what is being said. Every time Philip opens his mouth, every time he goes out to share Christ, crowds of people are there responding to the message. They're coming forward in droves. And so far, Philip, as far as we know, is the only believer there in the city of, in the city of Samaria who's sharing Christ with these people. And people are responding in droves, the crowds. Incredible success to his ministry. That's important to keep in mind later on when he goes out into a desert to witness to one person the Ethiopian eunuch. Who would you rather preach to? One person or a whole crowd? Hey, if there was only one of you here this morning, I wouldn't be up here. I would rather preach to a thousand people than ten. But Philip goes from a successful ministry in the city of Samaria to one guy in the desert. And it's hard for us to understand the type of success and the type of crowds that were coming to Philip. He was being well received by all of these people. There was something that sort of helped the success of his ministry a little bit. You read that down in verse 7. In verse 6, they were paying attention to what was said by Philip because they heard and saw the signs that he was performing and the miracles that he was doing in their midst. What kind of miracles? Verse 7, in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them, shouting with a loud voice, and many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed so that there was much rejoicing in that city. Philip had the ability to perform signs and to work miracles. Now, I mentioned this in connection with Stephen, that although... Luke goes to great lengths throughout the book of Acts as he traces the ministry of the apostles. He goes to great lengths to show us that miracles and signs and wonders were attached to the apostolic ministry, the apostolic credentials, but not exclusively so, because he does give us these two exceptions, Stephen and Philip, both who performed miracles. The types of miracles, they performed exorcisms, that's spiritual healing. And listen, exorcisms, just as a side note here, because we've dealt with this at length before, exorcisms are part of the gift of miracles. It's a sign. They demonstrated their apostolic credentials and the messianic authority by having the ability to cast out demons. Because Luke says he performed signs and wonders. What kind of signs? What kind of miracles? Exorcisms. Uh, Does ever... As you watch, if you ever watch Christian television, you see these guys who are always casting out demons. And every once in a while, Pat Robertson will do it. Somebody out there in TV land has a demon, and he'll just cast a demon out of somebody who's out there amongst the audience. And Lord only knows who that is. Is it ever dawned on you that Scripture never gives us an illustration, an example, or an instruction as to how to cast out demons? Why do we not read in the Bible, this is what you do to cast out a demon, one, A, B, C, D, do it this way? Why do we not read that? You know why we don't read it? We don't read it for the same reason that the Bible doesn't tell us how to perform a healing. It doesn't tell us how to heal paralytics. It doesn't tell us how to heal beggars. It doesn't tell us how to cure blindness and deafness. The Bible doesn't tell us those things. Why? Because we're not given sign gifts and miracle gifts. Those are for the apostles and for Jesus. It authenticated Philip's message. He went into Samaria and the Samaritans would ask, why should we believe you? You're a Jew. And you hate us. And we hate you. And you bring to us a message of a Jewish Savior who you say can save us. Why should we believe that? What was Philip going to do? He was going to demonstrate that Christ is who Christ said He was 
by performing a miracle in their midst and it authenticated his message. And it authenticated that he was a messenger of God. And the crowds came and Luke says there was much rejoicing in that city because beautiful are the feet of him who brings good news. Here the Samaritans had themselves a messianic expectation. They were waiting for a Messiah. And now Philip arrives and says, here is who he is. Here is what he did. Believe in him. And the people got saved. And the people believed and they were baptized and they followed Philip. And now they were being discipled and they were learning and they were growing and there was much rejoicing. And I want you to notice two things about Philip before we leave him and move on. I want you to notice this. Notice how God blesses a man who is obedient and uses his giftedness. Notice how God blessed Philip. What was Philip's gift? We're told that he was an evangelist. So what does he do? He evangelizes. And God blesses it. (laughs) Funny how that works, isn't it? God gives you a gift. You use that gift to serve somebody else. And he pours out his blessing on it. Isn't that amazing how God does that? Listen, that's the way it's supposed to be. You use your giftedness to serve the Lord. And that's what Philip does. He lays aside his prejudices. He obeys Christ and he walks out in faith to the Samaritan people and he evangelizes them and uses the gift that God has given to him. And God blesses his ministry with fruit. That's what he does. But the the fruit of his ministry is not strictly related to the fact that he was an evangelist and the fact that he preached. There's something that Luke mentions twice which is the key to his effectiveness. It's in verse 4. They went about preaching what? The Word. And Philip went down to Samaria and he proclaimed what? Christ. He preached the written Word and the incarnate Word. Philip had seen something in the apostles. There had been exponential growth in the church of Jerusalem and it was related to what? The apostles preached the Word. They took the Old Testament text and they preached Christ from those Old Testament texts and they just preached the Word. And people came in droves and got saved when they heard the Word preached. And Philip learned something from the apostles. If you're going to go to an unreached people group, you don't have latte Sundays and Kentucky Fried Chicken weekends and and movie nights and things like this to try and reach the lost. What do you do? You preach the Word. So he went down and he preached the Word and he proclaimed Christ. And guess what? God used it. Because Philip had the conviction that it is the Word of God which has the power to save men's souls. It's the Word of God that has the power to change people's lives. And so he just stuck with that. I mean, folks, if we've got the Word of God, the Spirit of God, the power of God, what else do we need? That's what Philip uses. In the power of the Spirit, he takes the Word and he just preaches Christ to these people. Now, verse 9 tells us a little bit about Philip's effectiveness. There was a man named Simon who formerly had practiced magic and he believes and then he is baptized and he stays on with Philip because he's amazed at the signs and the wonders that he sees Philip performing. Now, Simon is such an interesting character that we really need to deal with him in a sermon all by himself. So I just want you to notice that he's introduced in verses 9 through 13. Then Luke sort of takes a parenthesis in verses 14 through 17 to talk about the apostles coming down. And then he goes right back into the story of Simon. So we're going to take Simon and we're going to give him his own sermon, this sermon on Simon. And that's going to be next week. We'll deal with verses 9 through 13. But I want you to notice the second element this morning in verses 14 through 17 of this Samaritan mission. Verse 14, it is confirmed by the apostles. Now look at this. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen upon any of them. He being the Holy Spirit had not yet fallen upon any of them they had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they began laying their hands on them and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. And then verse 18 picks it up with Simon again. What's going on in verses 14 through 17? Luke gives us this account, but he leaves out so much information that we wish he had given to us. Why do the apostles come down? What reason is that for? Why was the Spirit not given to the Samaritans when they got saved? Is that the normal practice? Should we expect people to be saved but not receive the Holy Spirit and then to get the Holy Spirit at a later date or later time? How do we deal with these verses? They're difficult verses. And there's really no easy answer to them, but I'm going to, I'm going to put forth one that I think answers all of the historical context and fits in the message of the book of Acts. Interesting to note, there are two completely different and totally opposite groups 
that will jump into Acts chapter 8 and they'll read those verses and they'll say, see, that supports what we do. They use it as a proof text. The first group is Catholics who use this, these verses to support their doctrine of confirmation. They believe that a person gets saved in two stages. You're baptized, prefer, preferably as an infant, and then later on you're confirmed where the bishop, who supposedly represents the apostles, lays his hands on you and you receive the Holy Spirit. In the Catholic practice, it's largely ceremonial and it's largely ex- external. And not a lot of internal reality to what they, what they do. But they appeal to these verses and they say this supports us. The other group, interestingly enough, is the Charismatics. They point to this verse to back up their doctrine of slaying in the Spirit or baptism of the Spirit and the laying on of hands. So they will say, see, an individual can be saved, he can be baptized, and yet not receive the Spirit until a gifted leader comes along and must lay his hands on that person and they receive the gift of the Spirit. They are baptized in the Spirit, according to charismatic theology. Baptized in the Spirit, and that's evidenced by speaking in tongues and other ecstatic experiences. So the Catholics and the Charismatics will both go to Acts chapter 8, and they'll say, this supports what we're doing here. The question is, should you and I expect this to be normative? The uh, Assemblies of God, in their statement of faith, in what they call their fundamentals, these are the key, their key distinctives, say this, all believers are entitled to and and should ardently expect and earnestly seek the promise of the Father, the baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire, according to the commandment of our Lord Jesus. Listen, they say, this was the normal experience of all in the early Christian church. Was it the normal experience of all in the early Christian church? Or is there something odd going on in Acts chapter 8? I would submit to you that there is something odd going on in Acts chapter 8. These Samaritans had heard the preaching of Philip. They had responded. They had accepted what he said. And I believe not just mentally acquiesced to the message of the gospel, but in their heart had believed and been saved. And then they had been baptized in the name of Jesus. So Philip had preached the gospel. They had been saved and they had been baptized. But something was different. And I think it was something that was different that Philip could put his finger on. They've received the message, they've received the Word, but they haven't received the Spirit. Notice that Philip says they had simply been baptized in the name of Jesus. In Philip's thinking, there was something more that should have gone with that, but it had just simply been their baptism. There was something else that should have happened with their salvation that was not present that Philip recognizes. And so the apostles come down. Why do they come down? Really only one of two reasons. Either they absolutely could not believe that a Samaritan could be saved and they had to go see for themselves, which I really don't think is possible because, uh, or I really don't think is the issue because I don't think the apostles were that resistant to Samaritan salvation. Or they had heard, verse 9 says, sorry, verse 14 says, the apostles had heard that the Samaritans had received the word, but they had also heard that the Samaritans had not received the spirit. And the apostles say, that's not right. Let's go check that out. So they send Peter and John down there. Because I think Philip is able to discern. They've received the message. They've been baptized. But something's missing. The Spirit does not indwell them. And this is something that's so out of the ordinary that when the apostles hear it, they send a delegation, Peter and John, down to Samaria. Listen, what's interesting about Peter and John going down to Samaria to see if the Samaritans have got saved and to deal with this issue of the Spirit it was John who earlier in Samaritan had said to the Lord Jesus, just call down fire from heaven and wipe them out. And here he goes down to Samaria to his new brothers in the Lord. It's amazing what the Spirit can do to change your heart, isn't it? So John and Peter go down to Samaria to check out what's going on. And they show up and they see that these Samaritans have received baptism, they've received the Word, but they have not received the indwelling of the Spirit. So they pray for the Samaritans and they begin laying hands on them and they're receiving the Spirit. Now, it's not normal for an individual to be saved and yet not have the Spirit because all of the Scriptures teach that when a person places their faith in Christ at the moment of their salvation, they are indwelt by the Spirit of God. That's normative. In Acts chapter 2, when Peter was giving his Pentecost sermon, verse 38, Peter said, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. In Romans chapter 8, Paul says, If you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, and if you have not the Spirit of Christ, you don't belong to Him. Ephesians 1.13, we are sealed in the Spirit. 
Ephesians 4.30, the Spirit dwells in us and we should not grieve the Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6.19, we are the dwelling place, the temple of the Spirit of God. So is it normal to be saved and not have the Spirit? I don't think it's normal. I don't think the apostles considered it normal. And the book of Acts doesn't even give this as the normal pattern. Listen, in Acts chapter 2, did the apostles have to lay hands on all those 3,000 people that got saved at Pentecost before they received the Spirit? No, Peter said, you believe and you're baptized, you receive the Spirit. That's what he told them. Listen, in the book of Acts, you don't see the apostles running all over the Mediterranean laying hands on all these new believers so that they can receive the Spirit. They don't do that. In Acts chapter 8, later on, when Philip baptizes the Ethiopian eunuch, the Ethiopian eunuch gets saved and receives the Spirit without the apostles laying on their hands. In Acts chapter 10, Cornelius receives the Spirit at the moment of faith without Peter laying on his hands. In fact, without Peter really doing anything to try and save him. He's just preaching the gospel to him, and all of a sudden Cornelius gets the Spirit. And Peter's kind of surprised by it. In Acts chapter 16, when the Philippian jailer gets saved, Paul didn't lay his hands on him. In Acts chapter 9, when Saul of Tarsus gets saved, Ananias lays his hands on Saul, and Saul receives the Holy Spirit. Ananias isn't an apostle. There's hardly anything normative about this. How do we make sense of this? How are you and I to understand these verses? What's going on here? Listen, it goes back to this fundamental understanding of the book of Acts. This is a transitional book. And you're not going to see very many things that go on in the book of Acts. I should say it this way. You're going to see a lot of things going on in the book of Acts which are not normal. This is the laying the foundation for the church. You have apostles. You have prophets. You have sign gifts. You have all of these different things going on there which cannot and are not duplicated today. And this is a situation which is completely historically unique. And that is why you and I should not take a text from the book of Acts and teach it as if this should be our experience. We need to be careful that we experience the teaching of the apostles and not teach the experience of the apostles. There's a world of difference between those two things. We need to experience what they taught, not teach what they experienced, because their experiences are unique. So is there a way of understanding this? I think there is. And here it is. How many of you, by the way, before we get into this, think you have a clue as to what I'm going to say? Perfect. Nobody. Some of you are... Reluctant to raise your hands because you're just not sure where I'm going to go and you don't want to be proved wrong. That's okay. Here's what's going on. This is a historically unique situation. There had been a schism between the Jews and the Samaritans for a long period of time. This is the very first time that the gospel has gone outside of the city of Jerusalem, as far as we know. This is the first time that people who are not considered Jews are being saved and added to the church. So the apostles, there's got to be a reason why God is withholding the Spirit from this particular group. Why would God do that? Two reasons. When the apostles go from Jerusalem down to Samaria, the city of Samaria, God is going to authenticate uh, the, the ministry of Philip by bringing the apostles down there and allowing the apostles to lay hands on these people and say, we identify with these Samaritans. We give our blessing to what's going on here and to this ministry. So it kind of authenticates the ministry of Philip. So that Philip is not seen as this renegade who's out there preaching Christ to a bunch of heretics and half-breeds that we need to hate. So it authenticates Philip's ministry. And it allows the apostles to go there and to see, here are these Samaritans who we have hated until now, who are now our brothers in Christ. And they have received the Spirit on the same basis that we have received the Spirit. So when the apostles show up and they pray for them and the Samaritans receive the Spirit, now the apostles have visible testimony. These people are our brothers and sisters in Christ. They have trusted Christ. They have received the same Spirit that we have received. They are into God's household on the same basis as the Jews. The second reason that God would withhold the Spirit from the Samaritans for a period of time is this. It would do away with any possibility of schism or division within the church. You wouldn't have the Jews all huddle up down in Jerusalem saying, we're not going to have anything to do with those Samaritan believers. We don't even believe they're saved. And all the Samaritans up in Samaria saying, we're not going to have anything to do with the Jews or the Jewish apostles because we hate those people. And we'll believe in their Messiah, but we're not going to have anything to do with those apostles and the rest of the Jews. By God withholding the Spirit, the apostles come in. It authenticates the fact, yeah, they are saved. And it allows the Samaritans to see that they are under the apostolic authority. That way there is one church, one body, one faith, one Lord, one baptism. No division. Does away with division. 
There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, but we're all one in Christ. We all come to Christ on the same basis. That way you wouldn't have the Samaritan Church of Christ and the Jewish Church of Christ. The church could not afford to have a division at a rift like that at this point in its history. For centuries there had been a rift between the Jews and the Samaritans, and now the question was, would that rift be perpetuated? Would the Jew find Christ and the Samaritan find Christ, but the Jew and the Samaritan not find each other? Or would there be one Lord, one faith, one apostolic ministry, and one church? God's intention was that there would be one church made up of Jew and Gentile from people of all tongues and kindreds, and that they would be one in Christ. And so for that reason, He withholds the Spirit until the Jews can come down, the apostles, and see that they are getting saved. They receive the Holy Spirit. The Samaritans are under the apostolic authority, and the apostles see that, yes, there's one church, and the Samaritans are welcome in it as well. Does everybody understand that? That is the only way of understanding these verses that takes into context the historical situation and the whole teaching of Scripture on the whole matter. I wish Luke would have said all of that. It would have kept us from having to try and put together all of the pieces. It's obviously a very unique situation. It's something that's not duplicated. It's something that's not normal. It's not normative. But I believe that there was a divine purpose in it, and that was it. Now listen, division and schism were not the only things that threatened the Samaritan ministry. There's one more thing. His name is Simon, and he's Satan's man on the scene. And we're going to look at him next week and how he threatened the whole Samaritan ministry and how God dealt with Simon and revealed his heart. Let's pray. Our Father, we do thank you for your word. And although there are some passages which are very difficult to understand and and difficult for us to grasp, we do thank you that... So much of your word is absolutely clear and that there can be no doubt as to what you mean in it. And we just pray, Father, that you would help us to remember to lay aside our prejudices, to trust in you, to give us the power and the strength to share Christ with those in our lives and in our spheres of influence. There are people in our families, people in our workplaces, and people in our lives that desperately need Christ. And they need us to be bold and to do what Philip did, and that is to love them and share Christ with them. And we pray that you would prepare their hearts and that you would create a harvest in our lives through our witness and testimony for Christ. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast from Kootenai Church. If you'd like to learn more about Kootenai Church or to donate to our church ministry, you can do so online by visiting KootenyChurch.org. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and pray you'll join us again next time. Once again, thank you for listening.